During my last making cycle, I spent a week or so making a handful of different forms, mainly tableware pieces, plates, bowls, and other odds and ends, all different in form compared to those I usually make, such as these very simple flat bottomed plates. And in this video, I'll only be showing how I trim them, as it's been a busy week packing hundreds of orders to ship worldwide. I begin by trimming the tops of these, thinning out the outward sloping flange that encircles the piece. I start by trimming the top portion of this pot, as opposed to the bottom, as if I were to do this process. After turning the base, there's a good chance I could damage the freshly turned bottom. I also quickly skim over this portion of the pot to thin it out further and to create a surface that's as flat as possible. You may have guessed it by now, but I'm a potter who really likes to trim. I've always liked thin, light, and delicate pottery, so I take my time trying to make my work echo the ideals I want. I then take a flat edge tool and run it over this section of the plate, compressing the clay and flattening it. For this process I use the edge of the tool, as compared to this, which is burnishing, where I push the flat section of the metal kidney against the clay, as opposed to the sharp edge. This pushes back inside any granules of grog or sand and makes the surface much smoother to touch. Then, to trim the underside, I first place a wadge of folded over foam underneath the form, just like this. And really, it could be anything, as long as it spans roughly the distance between the base of the plate and the metal of the wheel head. Essentially, it prevents the base from sagging slightly as I trim it, as the force of turning away the clay and pushing down can be enough to deform the whole pot. So having something underneath, be it a piece of foam, a specially made clay chuck, or even a piece of sponge, will all help and will all do roughly the same job. Once positioned, I tap center the plate into the middle and before placing down lumps of clay around the outside of the pot, that will help support it and hold it in place. I use this moment to be able to trim this outward flange all the way down to the metal of the wheel head. I then take three lugs of clay and carefully push them around the rim of the pot, making sure that when I push them down, I'm pushing the clay against the wheel head and I let the clay that's squashed outward be the clay that actually holds the plate in place. This is opposed to actually placing these lugs of clay onto the rim or at least partially so, and applying pressure directly onto the pot, which could very easily damage and deform it. Now I can begin turning the base, and as I work, I'm constantly applying slight downward pressure with my left hand. Even when I'm trimming across the base like this, you'll see that my middle finger and my ring finger linger in place as the tool moves outward. This downward pressure is really important as it prevents the pot from wanting to leap out of the restraints, which might not be something that happens all too often, but when it does, it's very likely that the pot will be damaged. Otherwise, I'm just carefully trimming very thin skims of clay away from the base. I'm doing it bit by bit, as opposed to trying to remove too much clay in one movement, which is something I might do if I was more familiar with the form, such as with my bowls or mugs. But with anything new, I always take things a little more slowly. It is a wonderfully satisfying process, especially when the clay is in just the right condition, not too soft so that the form is distorted as you trim and apply pressure to it, and not so firm that it can actually hurt your wrists with the amount of pressure you need to apply in order for the tool to bite enough to remove clay. And once the base is trimmed and burnished, I seal it with my maker's mark, which is one I carved myself from a block of porcelain. The plate is then carefully gripped and lifted away before being carefully set aside and thereafter allowed to dry out to bone dry very slowly so that nothing warps or distorts as it dries. It's also worth noting that the term bone dry for someone who isn't a potter is the state the clay is in when all the moisture has left it but it is yet to be fired in the kiln. At that stage the pots are incredibly fragile especially when thinly thrown and trimmed.
once the outer rim is done, I go in and trim the inner well of the plate. An annoying process, as all the turnings simply fall back into the area you're working in. And I have no doubt that there'll be some people watching who are ceramicists, thinking, why doesn't he just do all of this during the throwing stage? And well, you could, but you might have a hard time creating a surface that's as crisp and fine as this, and I prefer to simply throw perhaps a little bit rougher, and then do the refining process during the trimming stage. That's all there is to it, and to each their own, anyway. If I was making more than six of these, say dozens or hundreds even, then I would make a custom clay chuck that fits perfectly on the inside form of these, so they could just be easily slotted onto it and then trimmed as normal. But the foam does work surprisingly well, although it does obviously still have some give to it, so you do need to still be careful as you trim. It's always a joy when the trimmings fly away like that, and thankfully all of the material that's removed during this process of subtracting material is completely recyclable. I dump these thin leather hard trimmings directly into water, and they turn to a fine sludge in minutes, which can eventually be laden out onto thick plaster bats, where the excess moisture is absorbed, and once the clay is back into the same sort of consistency as you might find it from a freshly opened bag of clay, I peel it away from the plaster bat and wedge it up, or knead it up, for those who don't know the term, until there are no air pockets left and it's one perfect, even, smooth consistency. Which is similar to what I'm aiming for when trimming the bases of these, although I do still quite like the contrast between a slight roughness of the fired clay compared to the smooth, glassy glaze that surrounds the rest of it. I quite like that the clay has a stone-like texture once fired, and all I do once this piece has been through the kiln and has been fired up to 1290 degrees celsius is that I very gently sand the base with some soaked wet and dry sandpaper, really just to remove the sharpest grains of sand that may still be there protruding, because even though I'm burnishing at this stage until it feels incredibly smooth, as the clay fires, it shrinks and recedes around grains of sand and specks of grog, thus becoming sharp once again, even on areas that were burnished to be glassy smooth. All of this does depend, of course, on what type of clay you're using. Some stonewares can be incredibly smooth, like porcelain, whereas others can be lightly grogged, like mine is, or incredibly coarse, so much that it can hurt to throw with, as the clay quite literally grinds away your skin. During my apprenticeship in Japan, the main clay body I used was a Shigaraki stoneware type, and it was literally full of bark and pebbles that would find their way into your skin or under a nail, but it was worth using for the beautiful texture it had once fired, as cavities were left in certain places where organic material had burnt away. And finally, once the plates have been bisque fired waxed, glazed, and then reduction fired, they're ready to unpack from the kiln, alongside about 150 other pots or so. This was filmed from another one of my recent firings, and I will get to the glazed textile video, I promise, but it may not be for a couple of weeks. And here's one of the plates fired on my new and still very flat silicon carbide kiln shelves, which is something I was waiting for really before committing to making a lot more flatware as my previous kiln shelves that were thicker were also slightly warped, which meant I'd be firing plates on surfaces that weren't necessarily perfectly flat. And as a result, the plates placed onto them would fire and follow the undulations of the shelves themselves. And here are two examples of some finished pieces, coated with a pale green and a white crackle glaze, which was coated on here very thickly 
which you can see in the rather dramatic and complex crackles. And as you can see on the flip side, the clay remains quite rough, a nice matte surface versus the glossy sheen of the glaze. I like the contrast, and now I just need to make more of these for a future shop update. And as always, thanks for watching, especially to those committed ones who watch right until the end.